With this, we, uh, we move on and uh, we move from uh, a fond uh, company that I used to work for and even a fonder company that I currently work in right now. And, uh, you know, we have uh, um, um, Raj Narayan, the uh, CHRO of uh, uh, Titan Industries, uh, who will uh, moderate the session for us. Uh, and as I invite uh, Raj in, please come on in, Raj. Thank you, Raj. And Raj has been a friend of NHRD uh, and my own personal friend for a long time. And let me invite uh, Amit, uh, Amit Agarwal, the country leader and VP of Amazon India. The most happening company and the most happening guy right up there. And I, I need to say this, uh, um, even otherwise. Um, I, I'm looking forward to this great session. What uh, we uh, are looking forward from uh, the two of you, uh, Amit and uh, Raj, is uh, how does Amazon uh, help create uh, a culture of customer obsession in its employees. We have heard of Amazon, we have heard of uh, the, uh, the culture of customer obsession, we have heard of a lot of stories, anecdotes, and we also keep uh, you know, viewing the videos. Uh, the Amazon Go video has probably been seen by more people in India than in the US. Uh, that said, you know, the, uh, the session today is uh, about uh, how we uh, create that. Um, and what we have also requested, Raj, is to uh, kind of have ample time towards the end for questions uh, from all of us uh, sitting in the hall. Up to the two of you. Good morning, everybody. It's important that we have uh, the energy really high. You know why? Unless your energy is high, our energy is not going to be high as well. Because for the next 45 minutes, you are our customer. Ladies and gentlemen, the next 45 minutes, uh, we're going to talk about customer obsession and how do we make sure as organizations that customer obsession becomes a way of life and how does an organization convert its strategy into practice I'd like to take you back uh, 30 years 32 years if you look at anything which is magical, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? When you think of magic, what first, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Can't hear you. All right. Somebody said Star Wars. When you think of magic as a child, what's the first word that comes to your mind? When you think of magic, abracadabra, correct? Would you agree? Well, in 1994, a person left his cushy job in Wall Street and said he wanted to create magic and wanted to name his company abracadabra. He called up his lawyer and said, that's the name of the company. The lawyer didn't hear him properly. He registered the company as Cadabra. He said, I want to call my company Abra Cadabra. And it said, the lawyer heard it as Cadabra. Then he said, nah, that's not the right thing to do. So then he changed the name of the company and he called it Relentless. Try Googling relentless.com and click on the link and you'll go to one of the fastest growing companies in the world today, Amazon. It finally got registered as Amazon. And Amazon, when it started off and was started its first store, had Jeff Bezos started with certain principles. And there were 14 principles that he laid out as part of how he wanted the company to run. And one of the principles that he put down there was the one on customer obsession. We've got Amit here, who's the country head for Amazon. Amit, this whole thing on customer obsession. As part of its leadership principles, I hear it's a, 
integral part of your uh, uh, leadership principles. How do you define it? So first of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, thanks for the history. Uh, it was a very fond memory. Just briefly, I've been with Amazon for 18 years, so 18 out of the 20 years. Uh, so, you know, have seen uh, a lot of this in action. So to your point about uh, the leadership principles, if you look at just part of that history, in uh, 1997, when Amazon went public as a company, uh, Jeff Bezos wrote his first shareholder letter. And I would encourage all of you to read his shareholder letters. I, I personally feel that ir irrespective of what you do, they are great life lessons. Uh, and I don't say that just because I work for Amazon. I genuinely believe, just like Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos' letters are life lessons. And he talks about the mission of the company, the purpose of the company. And uh, he introduces the mission of Amazon.com as uh, to be Earth's most customer-centric company, and which was considered to be a very vague mission uh, that it, this could mean practically anything. Uh, but if you look at his shareholder letters in the subsequent years, every year when he writes a shareholder letter, he attaches the 1997 shareholder letter and points out how nothing has changed in the company. It's exactly the same. Uh, what it was 20 years ago. And as you said, one of the principles of the company, we have leadership principles that employees uh, sort of inculcate. One of the first ones is uh, customer obsession. And uh, it's, it goes back to this principle at Amazon that the most important person in a room, whenever you're having a discussion, is the customer. In fact, uh, at, uh, in, in, old, in old times when, when we used to have meetings, Jeff used to bring a chair to the room. It was an empty chair. And he used to place it right in the middle of the room when we used to have meetings. And he used to say, imagine the customer is sitting right there. And it's our job to be answerable to the person on the chair. So we used to have this habit constantly of having an empty chair. It's a very strange meeting. You have an empty chair in the, in the room, and you're having this discussion. But we, we saw all our roles as being the advocate of that person on the chair. And that to us is customer obsession. As Jeff has also said, you know, it's the, the customer is like somebody you've invited to a party and you are the host. And your job is to ensure that the most important aspects of that customer experience are improved every single day. You need to ask yourself, am I better than I was yesterday for the things that matter most to your customer? And the customer could be a consumer, it could be a seller, it could be an author, uh, it could be a developer because of a cloud computing business. It could be an employee. It could be an, uh, a person in a different team just because you are serving that internal customer. So to us, customer obsession is about making sure that we are serving the most important need of that person and making sure that every day we are a little better than the previous day. And while doing that, you earn long-term trust, which we believe is about doing the right thing even when the customer is not present in front of you. But that's a very high bar. You know, that uh, sounds so uh, in line with the spirit of entrepreneurship. Because ultimately, as an entrepreneur, if I were to be, it's not the fact about whether I'm in the, uh, an investor in the company, but as an employee, I need to think as an entrepreneur from what you're saying. Now, how do you make sure that that individual employee, while this is very, very, uh, you know, really wonderful to hear, but how do you make it happen in practice? How do you make me, when I come to work every day, think about how can I make it better for my customer? What is it that you do as an organization and as individual managers to make sure that every person has that uh, spirit? Yeah, sure. I think that's a very uh, important question. And it becomes even more important when your, country, uh, when your company becomes $100 billion and $200 billion because companies lose their culture as they grow up. Uh, so we ask that question every day. I think the first uh, principle worth keeping in mind is, is something, again, we hear a lot in, within Amazon, is good intentions don't work. It's very important to know that in this world, everybody has good intentions. Everybody wants to work hard. Everybody wants to speak the truth. Everybody wants to do good things for the children. And telling them that you should work harder or always be honest, 
or do more good things for your children is like telling somebody who's already doing that work. So good intentions don't work. What works is specific mechanisms. You need a mechanism. A mechanism is a process or a tool that has 100% adoption and an audit process to make sure that it works. There's a very specific definition of mechanism at Amazon. When we talk of a process, we ask ourselves, is it adopted and is it audited? So it's a very scientific way of looking at it. So when we look at customer obsession, asking our employees to just be obsessed with customer is good intention. Every company, I don't know of any company in this world that says customers are not important. But there is very few people in this world, I think there is only Amazon to the, to the extent, that makes the importance an obsession. And there's a difference in that. And the way we do that is by putting mechanisms in place. So let me share two examples with you that might give you an idea of how seriously we take the notion of a process. So the first idea is about, first example is of how do we create new businesses? You cannot get anything done at Amazon, even talk of an idea, without first, I'm talking about first, writing a press release. So most companies uh, approve a project, they work on a project, they are ready to launch the project, then they bring their marketing department to write a press release to announce the project. At Amazon, we first write the press release. And this is for anything? Anything. Uh, even if you wanted to launch a new payroll system in the company, or if you wanted to launch a new HR policy, the first thing you do is to write a press release. The press release cannot be more than one page. It has to be not, more, not less than 10-point font. It's on a single A4 sheet that a customer of yours can read and answer the question, what is in it for me? Why do I care? If people sitting in the room cannot get convinced by that, we don't even try doing that project. The second thing that you write with a press release is an FAQ, which is answers to the common questions customer would have when they read the press release. So what I'm trying to get at is, we call that mechanism as working backwards. We start with the press release, then we start with the FAQ, then we start with the mockups, then we start developing it, and the PR team or the marketing team just takes the first press release and announces it. We don't write a press. So that's one example. Uh, if I can just stay with that example yeah. for a minute. Uh, I mean, that's, in some ways, when you, it sounds so simple, but it's astonishing that if I'm going to write a press release, that is the outcome of how will my uh, proposal be accepted and what it look like five years from now or whenever, so obviously you're saying that the whole ownership of it increases for whatever I'm going to say and whatever I'm going to do. Now, while that is good for a new proposal, how does it work for me as a person who's serving a customer? So I may not have a proposal, right? So how does this practice work for a person who's serving the customer? Just to understand that, you know? So you mean somebody who's on the field, for example? Yeah, on the field, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you know, what I'm trying to say is you look for mechanisms like these to inculcate. And I think cultures are self-reinforcing. So the everyday behavior matters a lot. So if I do this mechanism every single day, whenever somebody is talking of an idea, then it becomes natural in the organization. And there are many such processes. It's not the only process. Let me take an extreme. Let's, let's look at a customer service representative. Uh, you know, how would that person showcase customer obsession? Uh, so again, there's a great story. You know, there was, at Amazon, we often go and work in customer service centers every year to get a sense of what the customers are calling us about. You, you have to get yourself certified every year by working in the fulfillment center and working in the customer service center. Uh, so I, you know, I do that, everybody do that, even Jeff does that. So there was once when Jeff Bezos was in a customer service center listening to customer calls, and this customer calls up and says, I ordered a table from Amazon and it's scratched. And the customer service rep, the representative, put the call on mute and whispered to Jeff Bezos saying that I know what the problem is. And uh, Jeff was like, what is the problem? He said, our packaging was not good, so he's going to complain that the table was broken. And, and as you went through the call, the customer exactly said that. 
So when the call was over, Jeff asked this customer service rep, how did you know this? He said, oh, customers call us often about this problem. Mm -hmm. So he asked him, what do you do? He said, you know, we just let the business team know. So that's an example of victim mentality. That's you have this person on the field connecting with your customer and is completely powerless to work for the customer. So again, we went back to that intent, good intentions don't work and we worked to create a process we call as the and on cord. So for people who worked with Toyota, probably would know about this process that you can actually pull this cord in a manufacturing line and stop the production whenever you see a defect so that a defect cannot go forward. So what we did was we created a tool that allows the customer service representative without permission to take any product off the Amazon website whenever they, when a defect reaches a certain threshold. Wow. And there's a lot of data behind this. So now we have actually gone a step further that the product is automatically taken off and the business team has to seek the approval of the customer service representative to put it back, wow. which okay. is like a completely inverted process. So that's an example of a process that uh, completely puts I mean, the uh, power in the hands of the customer service. That's, I mean, awesome because I think that's empowerment at its best. And uh, for most of us folks who have looked at uh, organization structures and uh, you know, the, the lot of talk these days about how structures need to be more customer centric and structures, okay, and how structures need to be far more customer oriented with the customer at the center. What you just described is an implementation of that and I guess this has been running for a long time. Yeah? How do you, where do you see this going from a scaling up of this customer obsession? Uh, while you give us these two examples, as technology is changing, uh, things getting far more automated, how do you see this whole aspect of customer obsession, especially from an employee point of view, how do you see it scaling up? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, so again, if I sort of just look at how Amazon manages this business, it might give you an idea. It's a very strange company. We actually internally call Amazon as a very peculiar company. We in fact have a self-service quiz on the intranet site. It's called a peculiar quiz that everybody has to take. And it has really peculiar situations and questions about what would you do if something happened? And the answers are really peculiar because Amazon is a very peculiar company. Like for example, I was watching a video on Amazon Instant Video, the US version, we haven't la yet launched it in India. And uh, after I watched the video, uh, I get a notification from Amazon, an automatic, it, it was like after half an hour. It said, we observed that the bitrate of the video was not up to our own standard. We have refunded your money. And I was like, I didn't even complain. Why did they give my money back? And, and, and I think it's a very important life lesson that if you want to earn trust of someone, whoever that person is, in this case our customers, you have to do the right thing even when they're not watching you. Uh, everybody can do the right thing. If I tell you don't steal anything and I'm going to watch, put cameras, I'm sure everybody in this room will do that. But if I just told you for 30 minutes all rules are off, there is no police, there is no enforcement, would you still do the right thing? That's where trust gets built up. And I think at Amazon, we look for a lot of such automated opportunities to do the right thing of, for customers, even when no one is watching you. We don't build our processes and software for the 1% of customers that would abuse us. We build it for the 99% of customers that would love us. And then we deal with the 1% of abusers separately. So that's kind of a very different way of uh, thinking about the whole thing. And Amazon India does exactly the same thing in India. Right. Uh, before we move on to the next set of questions, I mean, I'm sure we have some customers of Amazon here. Are there any customers of Amazon here? Anybody who buys from Amazon? Thank you very oh. much. And <laughs> for folks who don't buy, please let me know if you have any feedback for us. So we're happy to learn from you. And even the folks that we buy, please send me an email if there are things that I could do better. <laughs> now, from the all of you who have uh, if I can hear, or we can hear one or two stories of you've been amazed by the customer obsession or how you've been impacted positively or otherwise by the customer obsession of the Amazon company as a whole as well as 
the people who work there. Anybody would like to share a story? Okay. The lights are so bright, I think I'll wear my sunglasses. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Shania and I'm from the Taj. So my story is about Amazon Prime. My husband and I wanted Christmas gifts last year to be delivered early because we were late. So we subscribed to Amazon Prime and it said, you have X number of months free. So we said, great. We gave, put in our card details and that was the end of that. Now, it said that at the end of this time, they would inform us that our time was up and if we wanted to continue with Amazon Prime, we'd have to actually make a payment, uh, which we had no intention of doing. So that time lapsed, but our card was debited anyway. So we wrote back to Amazon and said, hey, we didn't ask for this, and we just wanted the free trial period service. So they wrote back saying, we're really sorry. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. Keep Amazon Prime, and here's your money back. Um, and since then, we've now purchased Amazon Prime for each of us because we realized, like you said, that it's, it's about the customer. It's not about making the money. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from this side of the hall? Uh, oh, yeah. Can I say it? No? Okay. Um, sir, uh, my name is Asif, and uh, I'm from uh, Calcutta. I work yes, for PwC. Asif. <laughs> so once I ordered from Flipkart a power bank, and it only worked for two months, and uh, that's it. But once I ordered a phone for my father, and wrongly, uh, somehow the Amazon uh, app which I was using, uh, it actually sent me two, I uh, two uh, Samsung phones that time, and charged me also for two Samsung phones, some, some error or something like that, sir. Uh, so, and uh, I was traveling on business to Delhi and I was absolutely annoyed, my goodness, and, uh, you know, already I had to pay 25,000 for two phones. Then uh, I called up the customer service and, he, and uh, she said, okay, I absolutely understand your problem, I understand you're not in town, but still willing to help. But uh, she promised me, but she never happened. Then again, I, I was getting aggressive uh, and, and I followed it up. And uh, I told her that, listen, I, I may have done some uh, wrong because I am, I am uh, visually impaired and I use a screen reader to access the apps and all that. But, uh, you know, there was a puja holidays uh, in Calcutta, but the fifth day that lady called back and she said, we are refunding, we are we're collecting one extra unit which you got and we are uh, refunding the money within uh, next four working days. And I was pleasantly surprised to receive the one uh, within one working day. And that, to me, was a customer delight because she understood my pain points. And from then, I was a, a valued Amazon customer. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. That's, uh, thank you very much, both of you, Shania and Asif, for sharing those stories. I think uh, it only adds to what you were just saying. And uh, one question which I've always had, uh, especially in the last uh, few years. I don't know how many of you know, Amazon is the fast company which reached 100 billion, the fastest yeah, to have reached that. So that a frenetic growth by any yardstick. Now, with something like customer obsession, which uh, while, like you said, remains an intention at, uh, as strategy, for it to pan out in action as you're expanding that frenetically. And there's all that chaos and cacophony of uh, growth and getting into multiple countries and all of that. How do you still manage and ensure that with the hordes of new people coming in and uh, the complexities of uh, that frenetic growth, uh, how do you still manage to ensure that customer obsession remains at the center? You know, while it's good to do it, easy to do it in a smaller environment, and you're growing the fastest, how do you still manage to keep it on the rails? So, um, uh, you know, j just, just so that you know, you know at even at $150 billion, Amazon globally is growing more than 30% year over year, which is yeah. kind of, strange that you know every couple of 
two years, we add another Amazon uh, in, our, in our top line, which, which is very impressive. Actually, I, the way I look at it is customer obsession is the only reason why we are growing at that rate. So again, chicken I, or the egg? Sorry? Chicken or the egg? No, I, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> convinced and I'll tell you how we manage our business. Uh, unlike all this noise in the, in the landscape and newspapers about uh, who is ahead and so on, uh, there are zero goals that my team has on units and GMV or GMS. Uh, the way we manage our business on Amazon is very important to inculcate customer obsession all the way. The, a person is only allowed to take a goal that is controllable, which means that if I change something, I have a deterministic correlation that something will change. So you cannot change units because you, cannot, you can only give stuff for free. What you can change is the number of items in stock. That's controllable because you can put processes in place, you can build software, you can make sure that an item is in stock. Similarly, what you can change is the number of hours an item takes from click to hand, customer hand. Because they, you can put your logistics team, you can measure it. So at Amazon, we manage our business, what we call as using controllable inputs. And this, which is one of the reasons why we have always been comfortable missing Wall Street guidelines when it comes to our top line or bottom line, because we consider that uncontrollable. We cannot predict what our top line or bottom line would be. All we can predict is how much selection are we going to add, how are we going to make it price competitive, and how fast can I deliver? So when you run a $150 billion business or when you run a one rupee business, all you have is the same three sets of goals. So last 18 years, nothing has changed. All we measure is just three things. And that simplifies your organization so much. In India, you could have, I don't know, your mobile might be a, uh, you know, fashion in one, one year and some other year it might be wallet and some other year might be something else. But for the next 100 years, humans are not going to say, I want less selection.